if you could buy a book that contained a, a distillation of a lifetime of thinking and experience on spiritual matters by one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time, would you do it? Would you read it and study it and try to plumb the depths of its wisdom? What about if you could read aloud all six chapters of the book in only 19 minutes? Well, I'm speaking about Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The English poet Samuel Coleridge said that Ephesians is the divinest composition of man. And if you know who John Calvin is, it was his favorite letter. One writer called it the crown of St. Paul's writings, and another, another referred to it as the Alps of the New Testament, for the reader ascends into the heavenlies, and the view is breathtaking. Let me share with you a somewhat lengthy but beautiful quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones on this letter. I quote, The peculiar feature and characteristic of the epistle to the Ephesians is that here the apostle seems to be, as he puts it himself, in the heavenly places, and he is looking down at the great panorama of salvation and redemption. The result is that in this epistle there is very little controversy. And that is so because his great concern here was to give to the Ephesians a panoramic view of this wondrous and glorious work of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. He goes on to say, Luther says... The epistle to the Romans, that it is the most important document in the New Testament, the gospel in its purest expression. And in many ways, I agree that there is no purer, plainer statement of the gospel than in the epistle to the Romans. Accepting that is true, I would venture to add if the epistle to the Romans is the purest expression of the gospel, the epistle to the Ephesians is the sublimest and most majestic expression of it. There are statements and passages in this epistle which really baffle description. The great apostle piles epithet, 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 sorry, adjective upon adjective, and still, he cannot express himself adequately. There are passages in the first chapter and others in the third chapter, especially towards its end, where the apostle is carried out above and beyond himself and abandons himself in the great outburst of worship and praise and thanksgiving. I repeat, therefore, there is nothing more sublime in the whole range of Scripture than this epistle to the Ephesians, unquote. In general, Ephesians is a letter for the universal church, a timeless, a timeless exposition about becoming what we are, in Christ, but it's also an anthem to the sovereign grace of God displayed towards sinners in Christ. Within these chapters, it contains some of the worst news, such as you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and also the best news, but God made us alive in Christ, with Christ. I hope and I believe this letter, as we go through it, will motivate you to triumph over the challenges of this life and to walk in accordance with your heavenly calling. So as I normally do whenever I start a new book, I want to 
give you a good thorough introduction to the, this letter to the Ephesians. And then if we have time, I'm just going to go through the first two verses of this letter. All right, let's look at some basic information about Ephesians, the author. Now, the majority of biblical scholars, they do stand and believe, they stand on and believe that the apostle himself penned this letter. Now, this is based on a couple of reasons. In two separate occasions, Paul referred to himself by name as the author of the book. And secondly, the contents of the letter are so similar in some respects to Colossians that they must have been written close to one another in time. However, there is a small group, a small group of scholars who believe that the letter was written by someone else. But here's the thing, there are two arguments against this belief. First of all, the pseudonymity, writing under someone else's name, it wasn't practiced by early Christians. And secondly, the letter was frequently, frequently quoted as written by Paul by many, as er, by many early church fathers in the second century, including Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian. Now, because Paul speaks of himself as a prisoner in chapter 3, and Acts ends with Paul in prison in Rome, it seems to be the obvious place from which this letter was written. They're in prison. Also, the phrase, I'm an ambassador, in Ephesians 6, may suggest that Paul is in Rome, a city that ambassadors from other nations are sent or were sent. Now, if written during Paul's Roman imprisonment, the letter dates to approximately 60 to 62 A.D., along with Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Those are thought to have also been written around the same time. And that's why those letters are called the prison epistles. Now, since both the letters of Ephesians and Colossians are similar, and, only, and since those two cities are only about 100 miles apart from one another, they were probably delivered at the same time by Tychicus. Hopefully I said that right. All right, so where are we at? So the city of Ephesus at that time was the leading center of the Roman Empire. If you've read through Acts, you know that he spent a short uh, time in Ephesus on, a, on his way back to Antioch from his second missionary journey. On his third missionary journey, he stayed in Ephesus three years. Now, from what Acts chapter 19 tells us, Several remarkable things happened in Ephesus. Paul baptized a dozen of John the Baptist's followers. Unusual miracles occurred, and sorcerers were converted. In chapter 19, verses 23 to 41, the story is told about how the city rioted over a silversmith Demetrius's. Uh, the loss of business because of people who turned to Christ from worshiping the great Ephesian goddess, Artemis. Now, on Paul's return to 
Jerusalem from his third missionary journey, he gave a moving farewell address to the Ephesian elders at the coastal town of Miletus. There in Acts chapter 20, he reminded them of his ministry, warned them about false teachers, and then prayed with them before their departure. And that was the last time that he saw those believers there in Ephesus. Right, now let's look at some subjects, background, messages, and themes we're going to see throughout this letter. One of the main subjects of Ephesians is, is what Paul calls the mystery. But he doesn't mean something that cannot be explained, but rather a wonderful truth never revealed before, but now it's made known. The sublime truth is the announcement that believing Jews and believing Gentiles are now one with Christ. There are, they are fellow members of the church, the body of Christ, the universal church. At present time, they are seated in Christ in heavenly places. In the future, they will share in His glory as head over all things. The mystery is found in each of the Ephesians six chapters. In chapter one, it's called the mystery of God's will and looks forward to the time when all things in heaven and earth are reconciled to God and to one another. How's that? In union with Christ, they become one new man and how they form a holy temple in which God dwells by His Spirit. Chapter 3 gives the most complete explanation of the mystery. Chapter 4 emphasizes the body and God's plan for its growth to maturity. In chapter 5, the mystery is called Christ and the church. And finally, in chapter 6, Paul speaks of the mystery of the gospel for which he was an ambassador in chains. For a second, I want you to try to imagine the impact of this news to Gentile believers to whom it was sent. Not only were they saved by grace through faith, the same as the Jews, but for the first time, they occupied a place of equal privilege with them. They were in no way inferior as far as their standing before God was concerned. And they were destined to be enthroned with Christ as his body and his bride, sharing the glory of his universal reign. Now, central to the message of Ephesians is the recreation of the human family according to God's original intention for it. The new creation destroys the misguided view that God accepts the Jew and rejects the Gentile. Paul says the distinction was abolished at Christ's sacrificial death. Thus, no more hindrance remains to reuniting all humanity as the people of God with Christ as the head. The new body, the church, has been endowed by the power of the Holy Spirit to enable them to live out their new lives and to put into practice 
and new standards. And to put it simply, the overall emphasis is on the unity of the church in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So there, you know, as I studied, as I studied this book, I noticed that there's many themes found in Ephesians. But most commentators agree that one dominant theme of Ephesians is unity. The term unity is not used elsewhere in the New Testament, is used twice in this letter, and one, and the word one, sometimes translated as same, uh, such as in the New Living Translation, is used 14 times. The phrase is in Christ, in whom, in the Lord, or similar expressions occur 38 times in Ephesians, indicating the means by whom or the means by whom or the sphere in whom the unity is achieved. Unity is depicted in, in the church, and the church is described by various metaphors. Biological, the body of Christ. Architectural, a holy temple. And social, the wife. Furthermore, the body is united under the head. Who is that? I already mentioned it. It's Christ. Uh, now, although unity is a dominant theme, how is it achieved? How is that unity achieved? Well, forced unity is unacceptable because it's not genuine. It must originate from within, within deep in the heart. It must come from love, ladies and gentlemen, which is another dominant theme in this letter. Nearly a third of Paul's uses of the, fer of the verb to love are found in Ephesians. That's 10 out of 34 uses. The noun form, the noun form also occurs 10 times in Ephesians out of a total of 75 times in all of Paul's letters. The fre frequent use, use of love in this short book is absolutely notable and remarkable. Out of the 20 occurrences of love in Ephesians, eight refer to God's or Christ's love for humanity, 11 refer to the believers' love for one another, and one refers to the believers' love for Christ. You see, church, love in action within the, commu the community of believers, it fosters unity. That's why you hear me up here so often say, you got an issue with someone at the church, resolve it. If you want to be united as a church, if you really want to, others to see us, to see the love of Christ, then let us show it here among one another. The more we do that, the more we can be united as a church. And the more, again, others are outside these walls will see that. And they're going to be like, wow, I'm going to be part of that. I don't get that at my old church. All I get is backbiting and people talking behind each other's backs and There's just so much gossip. But that's not Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Now, of course, foundational to all these themes is the centrality and the supremacy 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has purposed the sum to sum up all things in heaven and earth in Christ, as verse 10 will say. Thus, thus, church, my fellow believer, we must know him and his power. See, God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above all other powers, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Everything in God's dealings with us centers in the person and work of Jesus Christ and our organic unity of being in Him. These then are some of the great themes that we will try to understand in a deeper way as we work through this rich letter. As Sir Francis Bacon once wrote, some books are to be tasted, others are to be swallowed, but some few, some few, to be chewed and digested. Therefore, enabled by the Spirit's illumination of the text of Ephesians, church, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is a man who takes refuge in him. So now with that as a general overview and background, I want to spend the rest of our time just looking at the first two verses. The first two verses of Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. And the word of God says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Within just these two verses, they tell us what God wants us to know, that God wants us to know who we are in Christ and how we came to be in Christ. First, we see there, there is Paul, the author of this letter. His description of himself tells us some things about who he was and how he came to be that way. Then there are the believers. His designation of them also tells us how much about who we are and how we came to be this way. Finally, his greeting sums up both how Paul and all believers came to experience this great salvation in which we now stand. There in the first part of verse 1, Paul's self-description tells us who he was in Christ and how he came to be that way. There he wrote, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will. Now, many of you know the story. And if you do, as, as you know, Paul's given name was Saul. He was a Jew born into the tribe of Benjamin, who was, was named after the first king of Israel. Paul was trained as a Pharisee under the famous rabbi Gamaliel. Gamaliel. We told that in Acts chapter 22. He was advancing in Judaism above 
all his peers, his countrymen, being more extremely zealous for his ancestral traditions. He heartily approved and assisted when Jewish letter leaders stoned Stephen to death. After that, Paul had ravaged the church, did great harm to the church by entering homes and dragging off both men and women in order to put them in prison and put them to death. And so one day as he was on his way to Damascus to bring any Christian from that city arrested in shackles to Jerusalem, God sovereignly intervened in Paul's life. A bright light from heaven suddenly blinded him. He fell to the ground and heard the Lord say there in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When Paul responded, Lord, who are you? The Lord said in verses 5 and 6, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. Just reading that again gives me chills. Gives me goosebumps too because I, I can imagine in my mind what that would have been like. Paul wasn't dissatisfied with Judaism. He wasn't considering various religious alternatives. Rather, he was militantly opposed to Jesus Christ and the gospel when, as he puts it in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, but when God who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. In other words, Paul didn't have anything to do with his dramatic conversion and his appointment as an apostle. He had nothing to do with it. Rather, all of it, all of it, his conversion and his appointment as an apostle happened by the sovereignty of, of God, the sovereign will of God. Paul was fiercely opposing God at the very moment that God literally stopped him in his tracks, blinded him physically, but opened his eyes spiritually to see the risen Savior. As an apostle, Paul was appointed and sent by God to preach the gospel, especially, especially to the Gentiles, whom he formally despised to his core with a passion. There was a time when there was groups of people, whether socially or politically, that I felt the same way towards. I hated them with a passion. But as I returned to the Lord and he started changing my heart, he started revealing new things to me, showing me new things, showing me who I truly was as a sinner. Things started to change. My brothers and sisters, church, those of you watching, listening, if you call yourself a believer and there's 
groups of people out there. That you just can't stand, that you despise with a passion. You need to check your heart. You need to check your heart and see where it's at because that's not the love that we're called to have. Regardless if it's someone's sexual orientation, their appearance, their social or economic status, the color of their skin, their political affiliation, their religious affiliation. You ought to have that love for those people, that love that Christ had. He didn't want to see anybody go to hell. Nobody. He came to die for everyone. Jesus died on the cross for everyone. And the other thing, too, what I, what I mentioned just a minute ago is who you will become in Christ, who you will become in Christ, it's all by Him. He saved you. He, you know, he's, he has you here right now. In general, in, in a bigger picture, He has you alive right now, but in whatever capacity he has you in within the church, again, it's all him. It's not because of anything that you've done. Because it's he's, what he's doing in your life. I, mean, I, I fought wanting to be a pastor. I tried to run from it. I asked the Lord, hey, pick somebody else, not me. And then when, as, as the time was getting, you know, as he was starting to speak to me about all that, I was like, Lord, if I have any selfish ambitions, please reveal them to me because I, I don't want to be standing up here with those ambitions. I want you, Lord, to be my ambition. That ought to be your heart as well. And even if everybody is opposed to what you're trying to do, God will still make it. I really believe God will still find a way to make, to make it happen, happen. The only way you can stop yourself from whatever ministry or whatever, whatever he has you in the church is... Only you can stop yourself by saying, yeah, you know what, I, I don't want that. It's not for me. I'm too scared. If you look at all the prophets, the apostles, those people, they, a lot of them, they tried to, to run away. The Lord kept calling them back until they finally surrendered. While perhaps none of us have had such a dramatic conversion, as Paul had. If we know Christ, if you know Christ as Savior, you know that it wasn't your doing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says that we were spiritually dead in our sins, living in futility, darkened in our understanding, excluded from the life of God because of our ignorance and hardness of heart given over to sensuality and impurity with greedness, with, with greedness. Yet, here's, here's the beauty. While we were in that condition, the glorious words of verses 4 and 5, there in chapter 2, chapter two verses 4 and 5, broke into our lives. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together 
with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And as it says there in chapter 1, verse 9, it was all because of his kind intentioned intention which he purposed in him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that glorious? Doesn't it just make you want to shout to the heavens, glory be to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in the second half, verse 1, Paul's description of believers tells us much about who we are and how we came to be this way. There it says, to the faith, faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. First, we are saints. Contrary to the po popular usage, saints is not a term describing extraordinary believers those who only who the catholic church says only performs miracles or are dead and you know have performed miracles after they died no in the bible all believers let me repeat that all believers every born again Christian, our saints, and all saints, all saints are believers. The word means set apart ones, holy ones, or sanctified ones. It means that we've been cleansed from all of our guilt by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. Thus, we are separated from this evil world and set apart unto God for his holy purposes. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, aware of this, but there's a Hindu temple in Nepal that uh, the people there are trying to cleanse, or you, people there are trying to cleanse themselves from their sins by offering sacrifices and by washing with putrid water, contaminated water, filthy water from a supposedly holy river. It's sad. It's sad because truly there's only one way to be cleansed from your sin and guilt. And that's through faith in the blood of Jesus, who offered himself as the substitute for sinners. It's not that dirty water that will cleanse you. It's not that clean bath water or shower water that will cleanse you from your sins. No, it's the blood of Jesus. Friends, Paul's second phrase to describe believers is they are, they are faithful in Christ Jesus. Faithful may mean that they are reliable and, or obedient, but here it probably has the meaning believers. No one is saved apart from believing personally in the Lord Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, is the object of our faith. So we must understand something of who he is and what he did when he died on the cross. So while saving faith is a gift from God, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it is, at the same time, something that we must exercise. When God opens our blind eyes to see 
our own guilty conscience, and also the beauty and glory of the person of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, we cease from our efforts, our, we cease from our efforts to save ourselves. And we cast ourselves totally on Christ. We were once blind. But when Christ changes us, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, given a fresh vision, a new vision of ourselves, of the world. We understand that we're guilty of sin. We come to understand that only Jesus can rescue us, save us. God places, places us in Christ Jesus so that all that is true of him becomes true of us. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Let me break that down again. In my words, by his doing, you are in Christ. Now you become the wisdom from God who became to us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, it's nothing of, nothing of us, nothing that we've done. It's Him, and that's why we ought to glorify God, praise God for all that, all that He's done. Finally, Paul's reading sums up how we came to experience this great salvation in which we now stand. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is Paul's common greeting, but it's also more than just a greeting. Again, as Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it, no two words are more important in the whole of our faith than grace and peace. Yet, how lightly we tend to drop them off our tongues without stopping to consider what they mean. Grace is the beginning of our faith. And peace is the end of our faith. Unquote. Grace is God's unmerited favor. We deserved his judgment, but he saved us and blessed us. Peace with the, whole, with, uh, the Holy God is the basic need it's the basic need of every sinner. We cannot appease him by our own sacrifices or good deeds because these cannot erase the stain of our sin. No matter how much you torture yourself physically, I know there's some people watching this who are probably doing that right now, who are hurting themselves, who are doing things physically to themselves, who are trying to do all kinds of works, all kinds of things in order to be right with the Lord. Again, there's nothing that you can do, nothing that you can give up, your good deeds that will erase your sins. Only Jesus, the blood of Jesus. But as Paul puts it in chapter 2, verse 14, he himself, he himself is our peace. Christ reconciled us to God. He gives us peace within our hearts, even in the midst, even in the midst of our trials 
And he, he reconciles us to one another. And so when we experience God's grace at the cross, instead of being our judge, God becomes our Father, and Jesus becomes our Lord. Let me put that more personally for some of you. When you experience God's grace at the cross, instead of being your judge, God becomes your Father, and Jesus becomes your Lord. Rather than running from God because you wanted to hide from your sin and because you feared his judgment, you can now draw near to God with hearts washed clean, white as snow. Instead of proudly running your own life to promote your own interest, you now Submit gladly to Jesus as a master seeking to do his will. So now as I close, let me ask these few questions. Do you know personally what I've been talking about? Has God intervened in your life and rescued you from your sins has he opened your eyes to see the beauty of the one who offered himself to the cross to be the substitute for your sins? If so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, right now at this very moment, you are a saint. You can call yourself a saint and not feel bad about it. I don't care what the Pope says and what who he designates as this. You are, according to God's word, you are a saint, a holy one, set apart to God from this evil world. You are a believer in Christ Jesus. You soak in his grace and abide in his peace. And so, with the next few weeks, new, few months, as we go study this book, this letter, deeper and deeper, you will begin to explore the treasures of this great salvation. There may be some of you who don't know this salvation, who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, who haven't been forgiven of their sins and don't know that means who haven't been, whose eyes haven't been opened. You're still in darkness. So if you're watching this, listening to this message, leave all that sin there at the foot of the cross, and the Lord Jesus will take it. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he died and suffered. He suffered and died to forgive you, to unload you of all that sin so that you may become a new creation so that you may be saved if you're ready to receive that salvation if you're ready to be born again I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and if you've never prayed before with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. I truly believe and confess that you died for my sins and with all my heart, I believe that you rose from the dead. And so now I turn from my sins, I repent from them and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. And thank you 
for saving me from sin and death. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. For those of you that sincerely prayed that and you want to know what's next, what do I, what's, what's, is that it? Well, no. Um, please let us know. Contact us. We want to help you uh, in your next steps, whether it's finding a church or, um, or maybe praying with you and, and talking to you a little bit. If you're looking for, if you're here in El Paso and you're looking for a church, not that the new year began, coming here, you will, believe me, you will um, learn a lot about the scriptures or from the scriptures, from God's word. Um, I pray you have a blessed week. Be a blessing to others. And we look forward to seeing you as we continue now, as we go through this book, uh, this letter to the Ephesian church. Those of you watching, have a great day. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.